I'm going to read to you what a man named John Guest wrote in Decision Magazine in, back in 1984. When I went to hear Billy Graham at Herringay Arena in 1954, he spoke about nailing our colors to the mast. That is a phrase from the old sailing ship days. Your color was your flag flying from your mast. When the man in the crow's nest saw an enemy ship, he would often call to have the color lowered so that the enemy could not spot the color and blow the ship out of the water. When you nailed your color to the mast, you were in effect saying, Come what may, this is who I am. This is my commitment. And if an enemy ship coming over the horizon wants to try to blow me out of the water, that is up to him. My colors are nailed to the mast. I like that. Nailing your colors to the mast. You're saying, I am committed and I don't care if anyone knows about it. I'm going to let people know that I walk with Jesus. And I'm not ashamed. The question I have for you this morning is, are your colors nailed to the mast? Are you flying your colors high? Are you living for God or are you not living for God? As I said before, this is a new section in the book of Romans. Paul lays out doctrine in chapters 1 to 11. And uh, I have a slide here, if we can advance it one, of, I think it's coming, there we are, um, of the basic outline. And if you're a note taker, this is a good thing to jot down. The basic outline of the book of Romans, we've got the prologue, and then the doctrine, and you can see under doctrine, it's God's holiness and condemning sin, God's grace and justifying sinners. God's power in sanctifying believers. God's sovereignty in saving Jew and Gentile. And now we get to the practice. And this will go all the way to the 15th chapter and the 13th verse. And this is the response to what we've learned in the first 11 chapters. So this is where Paul is going to get very personal with us. And he's going to say, okay, now you know the doctrine. You know the teaching. You know that you're saved by grace. Now this is how you respond to that. And you're going to see that Paul, as we go through the New Testament, Paul's general pattern of of forming his letters is just like this. He first of all lays out the doctrine, and then he lays out the practice, the response. So first it's, this is what God's done for you. Second, it's how you respond to what God's done for you. And it's very important that we get it in that order. And here's why. Because if you immediately go to the end of the book and you say, well, what do I have to do for you, God? But your heart is not established in grace. Then your service for God will not be based on love. It will be based on a performance mentality. What do I have to do in order to please God? And God's saying, if you receive my son Jesus, I am pleased with you. I love you. And now I just want you to respond in love to me and offer yourself and serve me like that. See, God wants a love relationship with us. So it's very, very important that we get the pattern right. First grace, then response. And so, here's our outline. If you're a note taker, write these three points down for for the outline of today. Number one, the yielded body. The yielded body. Number two, the separated life. The separated life. And number three, the transformed mind. So we've got the yielded body, the separated life, and the transformed mind. Let's look at the first one, the yielded body. Chapter 12, verse 1. I beseech you therefore, brethren... By the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. When he says, therefore, this is one of those words in the Bible where you have to find out what it's there for. So that means you go back to what was previously said. And he is saying, okay... What sums up the first 11 chapters is simply this. God has been merciful to you. 
God has been merciful to you. You see, every person is a sinner both by nature and by practice. We're born with a propensity to sin. You don't have to teach your kids how to sin. They just do it naturally. You have to teach your kids how not to sin. So we're born with that propensity and then we carry it out and we sin. So what we deserve as sinners is the judgment of God. And God's righteous judgment is to allow people to go to hell. Because if people don't want to have anything to do with God on this earth, He's not going to force them to go to heaven and be with Him forever. And so the Bible says, do not fear those who can kill the body, but after that have no more that they can do. He says, I will show you whom you should fear. Fear him who after having killed has power to cast into hell. Yes, I say to you, fear him. So we are, we are deserving of judgment, but because God loves us, he became a man in Jesus Christ and died on the cross for our sins so that we could be forgiven. So, this is the mercy of God. Mercy is not getting what you deserve. That's how you can define it. I'm not getting what I deserve. I deserve to go to hell, but I'm not going to hell. And so, Paul says, Therefore, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, in view of His mercies, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice. I beseech you, I plead with you, I urge you, I'm begging you. This is the language of grace. He says, I, I'm not commanding you, I am begging you, I'm pleading with you. Present your bodies to God. To present your body would be, in a way like the Old Testament priest presented a sacrifice to the Lord. They would come with an animal sacrifice and they would present it to God. We are to bring our bodies as a living sacrifice to present to God. Now what does it mean when we say to present our bodies a living sacrifice? Well, your body represents your mind, your will, your heart, everything about you. And so when you're presenting your body, you're saying, Lord, everything I am, I give to you. Everything about me, I want to use to serve you. I want this to be a vessel for you to use. Think about a glove. If you just put a glove there on the table, the glove can't do any work. It's just a leather thing. But as soon as you pick the glove up and stick your hand in it, then you can use that glove to do all kinds of things. This is what God wants with our bodies. He wants us to yield up our bodies to the control of God to use us so that He can use us to bless a whole world around us. And so, He says, I beseech you, I urge you to present your bodies a living sacrifice. You know, our bodies are what is called the temple of the Holy Spirit. So the Holy Spirit comes to live inside of us as soon as we become Christians. Just like in the Old Testament, they built that temple and then the Spirit came down and indwelled that temple and they met with God there. Well now, the Holy Spirit lives inside of us and we are the temple of the Holy Spirit. And the Bible tells us here in in 1 Corinthians 19, He says, Do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God? And you're not your own. For you were bought at a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. So he's saying, okay now, because you're the temple of the Spirit, glorify Him with your body. Offer your body to Him as a living sacrifice to live holy for Him. Now it's funny when you look at the words living sacrifice. Because naturally we think of a sacrifice as what is died. And in a sense, that's very true for us. Because when we give ourselves to God, we're dying to our own self. We're dying to our own ambitions, our own plans for our lives, and we're saying, Lord, I'm living for you now. I'm dying to myself, but I want you to live through me. And so, 
a, an Old Testament sacrifice was a dead sacrifice. But we, in contrast to that, we're living sacrifices. So we can continue on and on and on to be useful to God. Serving Him, alive to God. And the word sacrifice here means that it's going to cost us something. It's going to cost us. To, to live for God is going to cost you something. I was speaking with someone last week and sharing with this person about coming to know the Lord Jesus Christ and what it means. And I said, it's going to cost you everything. Did anybody tell you that when you first became a Christian? That it's going to, it's going to cost you everything. The funny thing about it is that when God takes it, He takes it little by little by little. But it's going to cost you everything. Because He gave everything for you, He wants everything uh, from you. C.T. Studd, this famous missionary to Africa, and also a a cricketer for England, played in the first Ashes series, he made this comment. He said, If Jesus Christ be God and died for me, then no sacrifice can be too great for me to make for Him. Isn't that the case? When you look at Jesus and what He's done, then no sacrifice that you can make could be too great. My job, I feel, as a pastor, is to bring each one of you to that point of total surrender to God. To to know the glorious liberty and freedom and joy there is in just being totally surrendered to God. William Still, in his classic book called The Work of the Pastor, said this, Israel's sheep were reared, fed, tended, retrieved, healed, and restored for sacrifice on the altar of God. This end of all pastoral work must never be forgotten, that its ultimate aim is to lead God's people to offer themselves up to Him in total devotion of worship and service. He's saying, you know, all those animals that they were raising there around Nazareth, or around um, Bethlehem, all of those sheep were raised up and tended and healed and fed for one purpose, and that was to go to the altar of God and be sacrificed. And as sheep, that's what we are to do too. We're to give ourselves to God and to live for Him completely. But notice what else it says. Offer your bodies, present your bodies, a living sacrifice, holy. Holy. Now this speaks of very practical holiness. Now holiness you can define as in two ways. God has made us holy when we receive Christ, but then God is making us holy practically every day. Holiness just means you're set apart for God, for Him to use. I have at my house a holy petrol can. Because I only put petrol in it. I don't put you know, a mix of 50 to 1 in there or 25 to 1. I put only petrol in it because I use it for my lawnmower. It's a holy can. God says, I want you to be holy, set apart just for me. Just for me to use. You can think of holy being Holy, W-H-O-L-L-Y. I'm holy for God. Everything about me is for Him. And then, not only holy, but acceptable to God. Think of the Old Testament sacrifices. Those animals that they brought to the priest had to be the best. They couldn't be second best. They couldn't be the leftovers. They couldn't have blemishes or defects on them. Uh, In Malachi chapter 1, verse 8, it says, When you offer the blind as a sacrifice, is it not evil? And when you offer the lame and the sick, is it not evil? Offer it then to your governor. Would he be pleased with you? Would he accept you favorably, says the Lord of hosts? (laughs) My pastor in the States, I remember him one time having to say to the church, We don't need any more broken couches. Because what people would do is they'd, they'd use their couch and it would get all tatty, tatter, tattered and broken. And they'd say, well, what do we do with this? Instead of taking it to the tip, well, let's just give it to the church. So we'll take the best and give them the scraps. 
And he says, I don't, we don't need any more of that, you know. God wants us to give our best to him. I want to encourage you, if you're a young person here today, live for God now. Give your best years to God. Some people say, you know, when I get older, I'll live for God then, after I've had all my fun. Don't waste your life. I want to encourage you, live for God completely now. D.O. Moody, when he had finished one of his evangelistic meetings, said, um, we had two and a half conversions tonight. And, and somebody said, what do you mean, uh, two adults and, and one child? He said, no, no, two children and, and one adult. The, the children have all their lives left to live for God, and the, the adults have wasted their lives. Don't waste your life if you're a kid. Live for Jesus with everything you've got, and you will not regret it. Nobody on their deathbed looks back and regrets living for God, but many people regret not living for Him. Give your best to God. Give the best of your time to God. You know, sometimes we say, hey, I've got to have a little bit of me time here. You know, I've, I've done enough for you, God. I've got to have me time. This is just all for me. You know, our time is all His. He's purchased us. He's bought us with the blood of Jesus. And all of our time is His. And I want to encourage you, and I've noticed this. When you put God first in your life and you live for Him completely, He gives you amazing times of fun, of recreation, of refreshment, of joy... You can't improve on that in your me time. So I understand, and I'm not against, you know, flipping on the television and just vegging out for a while or or watching a movie or something like that. I'm not saying you have to be on your knees and praying and going out witnessing 24-7. What I'm saying is, whatever you do, do it with God. Give Him your time. Give Him all your time. So if it's something where you're just going for a walk... Walk with the Lord. If you're going to watch a movie, if you can do it with the Lord, you'll be blessed. If you can't do it with the Lord, you shouldn't be doing it. If He can't sit there on the settee with you and watch what you're watching, turn it off. And your life will be amazingly blessed. Give the best to God. Give the best of your work to God. The best of your work to God. 1 Corinthians 10, 31. Whatever you do, do all for the glory of God. When I first became a Christian, uh, I was 24, 25 years old. And I had been coaching tennis for about three or four years. And I hated it. Because I thought, you know, I'm just teaching these people that can't get it. And little bratty kids and old ladies and they're never going to get this. And I just thought, okay, well, to me they're just dollar signs walking through the gate. I just wanted it, I wanted to do it for money. And so it was all about the money. And then I became a Christian and the Lord showed me this it's not that. You do this for me. The money's secondary. I'm going to provide for you no matter what. You just do this for me. And so I began to do what I was doing for God and it changed the way work was for me. I went to work doing the same thing I did before but with a different attitude and it changed it. It changed everything for me. It became my ministry. I want to read to you a a story about when they were building St. Paul's Cathedral. One day after work on St. After work on St. Paul's Cathedral had begun, Sir Christopher Wren, unrecognized by his work crew, walked among the artisans and stonemasons. He asked one stonemason, What are you doing? I'm cutting a piece of stone, he replied. He asked the same question to another stonemason. I'm earning five shillings, two pence a day, the second workman replied. He asked a third, third stonemason the same question, and the man answered, I am helping Sir Christopher Wren build a magnificent cathedral to the glory of God. Same work, different attitude. It makes all the difference in the world when we live and work for God. The third guy had it right. 
Give the best to God. Give the best of your money to God. The best of your money. This would be a good time to take an offering, I think. But I was reading about a pastor who was trying to illustrate this to his congregation. And he brought up on the stage an apple, and he's just talking, and he says, Okay, you know, giving to the Lord's work is kind of like eating this apple. So we get this money from the job and takes a bite. And the first part of it is the mortgage payment. Chews that up. And then after a little while, he takes another bite. Second part is the bills that we need to pay. Chews that up. and Takes another bite. And then food for the family. And then taxes. And then we've got to spend money on our kids. And then, don't forget the holidays. You know, we need to save up for them. And then the pension. And then shopping for me. And then leisure activities and hobbies. And he says, now what's left to give to God? The pits. (laughs) We give him our leftovers so often. God says in Proverbs 3, verse 9... Honor the Lord with the first honor the Lord with your possessions and with the first fruits of all your increase. Then he says, so your barns will be filled with plenty and your vats will overflow with new wine. The first fruits. Let me define that for you. That means that when they grow they grew crops, the first harvest of that crop was an offering to God. And they would give 10% on various occasions. And, and I'm not here to talk about you know, tithing necessarily, but I'm just talking about priorities. The best. Giving our best. Putting God first. I'm not here to, you know, to have you t- uh, give an offering this morning. Um, but the promise, notice, if we do that and we give our first fruits to God, is that our barns will be filled with plenty and the vats will overflow with new wine. That means God's going to take care of us. When we get our priorities right financially, He will bring a blessing. And so, give your best to God. Give the best of your life, you young people. Give the best of your time. Give the best of your work. Give the best of your money. And then finally, give the best of your love to God. What's the greatest commandment in the Bible? Love the Lord your God with all your mind, heart, soul, and strength. Jesus said the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. You know, there are a lot of things competing for love in our hearts. Family, friends, career, ministry, personal ambition, worldly success, self. Many things compete for our affection, devotion, and love. But God wants us to love Him more than anyone or anything. And sometimes God has to really put us to the test to get us to that point where we are loving Him the way we should. You remember in Genesis 22 when God called Abraham to take his son up to Mount Moriah and to sacrifice him. Now God's not in the child sacrifice. That's not the point. He never intended for him to kill him. But what he was doing was he was removing Isaac from his heart so that God would have been first on his heart. Isaac became an idol in his life. The first mention of the word love in the Bible is in that chapter. He loved his own son. And the problem was he began to love him more than he loved God. And God had to take these drastic measures to bring him to the point where he would love God more than anything. And God will do that in our own lives too. Where it may be something that we think is a tragedy. And God is bringing us to that point where it, I love you God with more than anything or anyone in this whole world. I love you. He says at the end of verse, two, verse 1, this is your reasonable service. Reasonable service. Maybe your Bible says spiritual act of worship. An Old Testament priest had to have a sacrifice to come before God. And so do we. We have to have a sacrifice to come before Him. And 
he says it's just reasonable to do this. It just makes good sense. If God is God, it is reasonable to have us serve Him with everything we've got. Now in your mind, I want you just to do this with me for a moment. I want you to fast forward to that day when you stand before the judgment seat or the bema seat of Jesus Christ. If you're a Christian here today, you're not going to be judged for your sins. You're not going to stand at the white throne judgment. The, the penalty for sins has been paid for. If you're not a Christian, you'll stand before that judgment seat, the great white throne, and you'll be judged for your sins. And God will reluctantly send you to hell. But as a Christian, you will stand before God at the Bema seat to be rewarded based on how you served Him in this life. So as a Christian, I want you to fast forward in your mind. And I want you to think about when you stand before Him at the Bema seat on that day, what will be the most important thing to you then? It will be that you lived your life fully for Him now. Okay, rewind now to now. Okay, if that's what's important to you then, then that's what should be important to you now. And that will really help you to strip away all the things that come at you and they demand your attention, they demand your loyalty. And you have to say, no, my loyalty is to God. And I'm going to serve Him with everything I've got. Now if your Bible says spiritual act of worship there, Um, Worship is more than just singing. Worship is living your life for God. You can live your life for God in an act of worship, and then the singing just becomes like an overflow of your whole life. So that's what we do on Sunday mornings. We get together and we just sing to Him as an overflow. But it doesn't stop on Sundays. It goes through all the week. And so... Look at that verse again. I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. I'm going to stop there and I'm going to pick up the rest of it next week. I want to urge you with something. I want to plead with you and I want to encourage you nail your colors to the mast say to the Lord I I want to live for you completely, I'm not going to hold anything back I know enough about you that I can trust you with everything you're not going to give yourself to somebody you don't know And we've read through the first 11 chapters of this book and it's talked about who we are and God knowing everything about us and how much He loves us and died for us. And when you know the cross and you know what He's done for you, well then, you know His heart. And you can just say, Lord, I'm just going to give myself to You. I'm going to entrust my whole life to serve You. Nail your colors to the mast. Be totally sold out for Him. If you're here this morning and you don't yet know Jesus, oh, His love for you is so powerful and so great. And He wants you to know Him. He wants you to give your life to Him and surrender to Him and receive Christ as Lord and Savior. To know forgiveness. The Bible says that when a sinner repents, when we receive Christ... That there is more joy in the presence of the angels over one sinner who repents than over 99 just people who don't need to repent. I like that because it says there's more joy in the presence of the angels. Well, who's in the presence of the angels? God. It's God just going, yes! You got it. You, you got it. You know I love you and, you and you've received my son. And now I love you. And... And you're, you're in my family. Ah. Oh. So that's my prayer. I beseech you. If you're a Christian, give yourself to God. If you're not a Christian, receive Christ and give yourself to God. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for this word that we've looked at today. And I pray now as we um, 
just have some time of fellowship with each other that as we've given our lives to you, Lord, that you would use us to love one another, to share our spiritual gifts with one another, that the whole body might be built up. And Lord, just to have a great time. Father, I pray that this week you'd give us many opportunities to let other people know about this amazing love that you have for people. And I pray, Father, that, um, Lord, you'd be the lifter of every person's head here in this building. Lord, we get bowed down low. We, we look at the things that have happened in Paris and around the world. And, Lord, we can get low. But you're the lifter of our heads. And we pray that you do that. And so, Lord, we just want to say thank you. Thank you for your mercy. In Jesus' name. Amen.